everybody. We're back for the second half of lecture 12, in which I talk about glacial erosion, how glaciers remove material and break down the rocks surrounding them. Glaciers, it turns out, are very effective agents of erosion. They basically remove everything in their path. And in Antarctica, the main force of nature that sculpts valleys and removes rock is glaciers rather than liquid water, as it tends to be elsewhere in the world. Now, glaciers carry material in a number of different ways. Um, it is no coincidence that a glacial pace means that something is moving slowly to the point of being tedious, as in this glacially paced movie is the most boring thing I've seen in years. Now, I don't think glaciers are boring or tedious, but they do indeed move extremely slowly. Most Antarctic glaciers move on average around 500 meters a year to 600 meters a year. A chart studying movement along different portions of the Bird Glacier is shown on the upper right. And it's colored in grayscale to show that the ice moves at different speeds in different areas. The ice along the 600 line, like a topographic line, all of the points along this line are moving 600, 600 meters a year. Well, those points along the 400 line at the edge are moving closer to 400 meters a year because the part of the ice near the edge is experiencing more friction with the surrounding rock. And it is indeed kind of like a topographic map, and I think that's cool. Now, the some glaciers do go faster. The record for the fastest glacier is the Jakobsham Glacier in Greenland, which actually moves up to 17 kilometers a year, or 1,700 meters a year. About twice as fast, about almost three times as fast as the fastest parts of the Bird Glacier, in fact. Now, as they move, glaciers will carry things on top of them. They will, they will grind the rock underneath them, and they will also carry whatever falls on top of them. They transport whatever falls onto the surface, such as windborne dust, soil, falling rocks, and even meteorites. In fact, people go to Antarctica to find meteorites because it's easier to spot them. Because when they fall on the glacier, the dark colored meteorites really stand out against the ice. And so they've found quite a few meteorites in Antarctica, and they've had better luck tracking them down than they do elsewhere in the world, where they get covered in vegetation faster and are hard to spot against the similarly dark colored ground. Now, the picture on the lower right, I hope, gives you a sense of how much of a crust can form on top of a glacier, just how much dust and grime and gunk there is on top of them. They will, they will also drag material underneath them, and that all ends up being deposited at the ends of glaciers, to a big extent in the terminal moraines, the piles of sediment that I showed you in an earlier diagram. So glaciers can erode by one of two methods. Erosion refers to the re removal of material by geologic processes, and by material, I mean rock, soil, and sediment. Glaciers erode in two ways. The glacier can either, either, the, either the glacier breaks down the underlying rock by, by grinding it into tiny pieces, or the glacier plucks. Now, the glacier, it's actually a combination of the ice and the rock being dragged by the ice that's breaking down the underlying rock. The underlying rock will be ground into tiny pieces, and that is known as ablation. But glaciers can also pluck large pieces of rock away in a scenario that we'll talk about. Glaciers are more effective than liquid water at removing material, but how effective they are depends on their mass and volume, basically how massive they are. And it can also depend on their speed. In general, you might expect a faster glacier to be a more effective source of erosion, but that's not necessarily true. Alpine glaciers will carve U-shaped valleys into the mountains and plateaus that they're, that they're growing in. Well, continental glaciers basically erode or flow over everything in their paths. So the ice sheets, like those in Antarctica, are extremely effective agents of erosion. They can they can put, they can they can grind away entire mountains, and those mountains that they don't grind away, they just grow over. The glacier just flows over everything. And when the glaciers flow over everything, they turn the rock into a number of different products that are defined by their grain size and by where they end up. Glaciers leave behind a number of distinctive marks in the geologic record as a result of erosion. And remember that this evidence was used by scientists as evidence for continental drift. Glaciers often can be pretty easily observed in the fossil record. And ablation by glaciers produces till, 
which is very fine grained and poorly sediment, excuse me, poorly, poorly sorted sediment, meaning that it's a combination of sizes. And that is the sediment that is pushed and pushed under by the glaciers themselves. You also have outwash, which is, which is the sediment that's carried by meltwater, the water that's melting at the end of the glaciers. And you have glacial flour, um, which is a type of outwash made of very finely ground down quartz crystals that is fine enough to be suspended in ocean water. You also have varves, which are a particular pattern you can get with outwash in which summer outwash layers carried by meltwater alternate with winter layers that don't have any deposits from the glacier. And the other products can include drop stones where you have the glaciers plucking pieces underneath them and dropping them out in the ocean in the example of glaciers that flow over the ocean. You can also have erratics where glaciers melt and leave behind those plucked boulders on land if the boulders don't end up being mixed into till instead. And if the glacier is ending on land, it's going to end in what is known as a terminal moraine. And the terminal moraine is a hill consisting of poorly sorted sediments, meaning again, that there is a wide variety of sediment sizes. You have pebbles and large boulders mixed in with sand and clay. Most glacial sediment is fine grained because the glaciers crush and grind a lot of what they're flowing over. But since glaciers do pluck some larger pieces and also because they sort of bulldoze everything out of their paths, you get a, you get a mix of sizes, even if it's overall dominated by smaller sediment grains. And some particular evidence of ablation that we can see is what are known as striations. When you have these, when you have these lines forming from the flow of a glacier in a particular direction for a sustained period of time. We can often see this in areas where glaciers have been recently present, like in areas of the Andes Mountains or North America that were covered by ice sheets during the most recent glacial period. And since glaciers move pretty slowly and continuously, they do a good job of polishing the rock underneath them and leaving it extremely smooth. So sometimes you just get this polished surface where the glacier has just done what a rock polisher would do. The rock is really smooth and shiny, but if the glacier is flowing really strongly in one direction, like if it's being channeled through a valley and the flow is very intense in one direction, you can get these striations forming. The striations can even form into grooves, like ruts on a road when you get tires wearing the road down in a particular spot, where you have the striations turning into grooves. That can happen when the glacier has been flowing for a particularly long amount of time. Now, the other, aside from ablation, the other type of erosion is plucking. When a glacier flows over a more resistant mound of rock, this causes the pressure to build up since the rock won't give way. The increased pressure allows some of the ice to melt and that allows the glacier to move over the mound via glacial slip. As soon as the glacier passes the end of the resistant mound, the pressure suddenly drops again. And this causes the meltwater to suddenly freeze. The meltwater freezes to the ground. And this causes the glacier to become cold base, at least for a moment. And it becomes frozen to the rock underneath. And a large chunk of that rock gets yanked away, gets torn away from the, from the bedrock by the force of the glacier moving forward. The glacier isn't moving very fast, but it still has enough force to rip the rock from the bedrock. And this leaves behind a chatter mark, a curved indention where the rock was plucked. And the, in this case, what was happening is the glacier was flowing from up here and it was flowing down this hill. And here, the pressure dropped where the glacier was flowing down, where the, where the glacier was suddenly flowing downhill again, or it was flowing more steeply downhill and where it wasn't being forced over the rough rock as much. This is the edge of the rock and the glacier isn't flowing, the glacier isn't right on top of it anymore. So the pressure has been released and that causes a momentary formation of meltwater between the glacier that would have been on top of this and the rock. And that causes part of the rock to be torn away with it. So that is what these are, chatter marks. And you can find them in some areas. They are evidence that glaciers have been here, that glaciers once tore bits of rock away as the glacier was slowing down the slope. And here's another diagram showing where pressure is high and low in this situation. The plucking occurs where 
the glacier is under high pressure where it's flowing over this resistant mound of rock. There's more pressure from the friction here. But when the glacier finishes flowing over this more resistant mound of rock and it sort of drops down, then the pressure drops. And that's what was happening in the previous example, oops, where the glacier suddenly starts to flow down here, the pressure drops that causes the, that causes the meltwater to freeze and that rips the rock away. And that's what's happening here. You're having, oops, you're having plucking occurring here where the pressure suddenly drops. And so a glacier that plucks a lot is experiencing differences in its flow. It's experiencing buildup of stress in some areas. And where, when that stress is released, that causes plucking. Now, as for the sediment that's produced by glaciers, the vast majority of it is known as till. And till is a mix of abraded rock and plucked pieces of rock that are carried under and bulldozed forward by the glacier. They are deposited as the terminal moraines or the hills at the end of the glaciers that we talked about earlier. And till is mostly fine grained because the glaciers largely grind the rock underneath them, but it contains lots of pieces of medium and large rocks that have been removed by plucking or that have simply been carried on top of the glacier as ice rafted debris. And so it's considered poorly sorted. Glaciers, again, also just sort of push everything out of the way. When till is lithified, when it becomes a rock, it becomes a particular type of sedimentary rock known as diamictite. And diamictite is mostly fine grained. It mostly looks like shale, meaning that it has fine grains of sediment that are too hard to see with the naked eye, but then it'll have larger chunks of rock in it, a, a lot of them. And often they're still, often they're, they're often relatively angular because some of these pieces were carried on top. They're less, they're less rounded than they necessarily would be by liquid water. And this diamectite can be powerful evidence in the rock record that glaciers were present. And it's one bit of evidence that was used to support the theory of continental drift. And this is the terminal moraine itself. You can, this is more of a side view and you can see how it is indeed a hill. It's where everything bulldozed by the glacier and being rafted on top of it gets piled up where the glacier melts. And notice, notice how it looks like a pile that's been bulldozed. That is really what the glacier is doing to the sediment. Moraine in general can refer to mounds of sediments. Terminal moraines are the particular piles of sediment at the end of a glacier. But you can also have some that form on the sides of glaciers where sediment piles up on the sides, or sometimes piles of sediment will form along fast moving lines of ice. Notice how in this example, we have several end moraines and there's not just the one where the glacier is pushing sediment out to right now. This shows that the glacier has extended further out in the past. This end moraine shows that the glacier at one point was as big as this and that it's probably retreating. Now, at the end of a glacier, it is melting. The glacier is melting into liquid water. It may sometimes also be sublimating or directly turning into water vapor. But if, especially in temperate glaciers in places like Alaska, you have a fair bit of liquid water forming at the end. And the outwash is the sediment that is carried by the meltwater. The meltwater is very slow moving. It's a trickle coming from the glacier. And so it only has enough energy to carry very fine or tiny particles of sediment. So the outwash will tend to consist of fine grains. It'll have the consistency of mud with a little bit of sand. Now, outwash often ends up in lakes and it can leave a really interesting geologic record there. In lakes that have a large amount of input from glacial meltwater, we sometimes see outwash in the sediments. This is not as common in Antarctica, but in areas where glaciers experience different amounts of melting seasonally, you can have patterns known as varves forming. And varves are these alternating light and dark layers of sediment that form in lacustrine or lake depositional environments. And varves are a seasonal cycle. In the summer, when the nearby glacier is being warmed more by the sun and thus melting more, the meltwater is carrying more outwash to the lake. And the outwash consisting of the silt and the sand eroded from the glacier's underlying rock will normally be lighter colored and more rich in silica than the usual dark lake mud deposits. But in the winter, when the glacier isn't melting as much, there won't be as much of this light colored outwash ending up in the lake 
and it'll be dominated by lake sediment again. Notice how the white layers are thicker. There's more sediment coming from the outwash from the glacier than there is sediment accumulating in the lake without the influx of the glacier sediments. Now, when we study climate change, we will often look at VARVs to see whether the lighter layers change, get thicker or thinner as you move from lower down rocks, the older rocks, to the upper higher rocks, which are the younger ones. And that can help us observe if the summers are getting longer, if the periods of melting are greater, which would actually indicate that the glaciers are retreating. Now, a particular type of outwash is tiny, tiny ground down pieces of quartz. The mineral quartz is normally a very hard mineral to break down. Glacial flour is about as fine as you can grind quartz crystals down. It's named glacial flour because it has the consistency of flour and it colors the water this sort of turquoise color because of the optical properties of this mineral. Minerals, it turns out, will reflect, they will reflect, refract light in different ways. And if you have a lot of tiny quartz crystals suspended in the water, that will cause the water to look a distinct turquoise color. And glaciers can grind down quartz into flower size. Quartz is one of the hardest minerals to break down in general. It is very quite resistant to erosion. Um, but I have some appreciation for glaciers in that the continuous ablation excuse me, the continuous abrasion of glaciers can grind quartz crystals down to this tiny size, to the point where they are suspended in water. And do be careful about that, abrasion and ablation. Ablation is the melting of glaciers. Abrasion is when glaciers grind rocks underneath them. And places like Iceland or Alaska often have bays or lakes that have this color because you get a lot of glacial meltwater carrying glacial flour into them and coloring the water this way. Now on land you have one bit of evidence of glaciers that consists of these boulders that just seem to be lying in the middle of nowhere. Some of the larger pieces that some of the larger pieces carried by glaciers are either large plucked bits of rock or they are boulders that are rafted on top of the glaciers as ice rafted debris. And when you have just boulders that are left behind by glaciers, those are known as glacial erratics. They're often referred to as such because they just appear as these boulders just sitting in the middle of nowhere, far from the mountains, far from any glaciers, far from really anything. But the boulder was carried by a glacier long ago and left behind by a glacier that has since melted. It's a glacial erratic because it's kind of just out there in the middle of nowhere for no apparent reason. But now that we know that glaciers covered much of the continent previously, the glaciers did use to carry boulders out here. But when the glaciers melted, they left those boulders behind. Often these glacial erratics will have a really different rock type than what you would expect. Like this might be a volcanic rock from volcanic mountains far away. And the glacier might have carried this chunk of rock eroded from these volcanoes miles and miles and plop them down on the sediment where the bedrock is mostly limestone. So this rock appears to be out of place. It appears to be erratic, but if you factor the glacier in, that actually explains how the rock got here. This is what it would have looked like when it was car being carried on the glacier. And now it's just sitting out here. Now it's just sitting out here in the middle of nowhere. And you see this in, you see this in Canada and the Great Plains of North America because those were covered with glaciers. Now, in the ocean, plucked boulders that are on the undersides of glaciers can be carried out to the ocean in Antarctica, where the ice shelf extends out over the ocean. And the pieces of rock that are stuck in the ice will get carried out over the ocean until the glacier starts to melt, or the iceberg that contains the pieces starts to melt. Ocean sediment that is from the deep ocean is normally very fine grained farther out from the shore, away from the influence of waves, the ocean water doesn't have very much energy and so it can only carry mud-sized particles. Deep ocean sediments tend to be mud or sometimes carbonate or silicate oozes from plankton. But sometimes the, but sometimes you will find these layers of ocean sediment or sedimentary rock 
And you can observe that there is this boulder here. You have these nice layers of sediment that appear pretty continuous across. And then it just looks like someone dropped a rock in there and ruined the pattern. And what happened is that a glacier dropped a large plucked bit of rock into the ocean sediments. And the ocean sediments kept being deposited on top of it. But in the rock record, we have evidence that we have this deep ocean sediment setting where there were glaciers on top of the ocean surface way above and those glaciers were melting and dropping drop stones. So that is often very powerful evidence for glaciers and especially the fact that there are glaciers at sea level. Again, remember that they found snowball earth by discovering that there had been glaciers at sea level in latitudes that are indeed equatorial. They found evidence that they also found evidence that there had been glaciers in South America and Australia before, and that indicated that those continents had been closer to the poles at one point. So drop stones can be very powerful evidence. And they're a very good thing to find in the fossil record in terms of understanding what the climate was like when the sediments that these drop stones are disrupting were deposited. That is about all we have for glaciers, but the last topic I wanted to introduce for glaciers is ice cores. And remember how I mentioned that snow is less compact than ice? 20% of, only about 20% of the volume of glacial ice is going to consist of air. And the air bubbles in glacial ice are not connected. When the snow gets compressed that much, like at the bottom of one of these Antarctic ice sheets, the air is actually trapped in these individual air bubbles. Now, since the Antarctic ice sheets, and especially the East Antarctic ice sheets, have been there for thousands of years, they have formed quite a thick record of glacial ice. It turns out that scientists can drill down into the ice, obtain a sample known as an ice core, and analyze the air bubbles inside to examine their atmospheric chemistry. Something we'll talk about again is that it's relatively easy to figure out how old the air bubbles are. Um, because it's pretty easy to figure out how thick the glacial ice is and how and what layers of ice were deposited in different years. And we can actually see how atmospheric chemistry, like how global concentrations of carbon dioxide have changed over the past thousands of years. A lot of this is for putting modern climate change in a context. A lot of the a lot of the research that has indicated that the current climate change is well outside of outside of what we would consider normal ranges has been from obtaining a record of normal variation of carbon dioxide levels from the ice cores. The ice cores have provided a backdrop to show us that yes, the current increase of carbon dioxide emissions is indeed way outside of the normal range. So that's a bit of a grim a grim forbearing of what things are to be when we get to climate change. But I do have one last bit of erosion to talk about. Most erosion in Antarctica occurs via glaciers, but the strong winds also do sculpt what exposed rock there is. And the winds in some areas, like the dry valleys, blow so strongly and continuously enough on the rocks that they will break them down. The wind erosion will tend to form these cave-like structures and these, these sort of overhangs they'll produce these, the, cave, the caves will kind of expand to produce ridges and they'll start breaking into tiny pieces and you'll get these cool little skull-like formations forming. Um, these are known as ventifacts, features made by the wind. And they, I saw some pretty interesting ones when I was at Antarctica. Here's my advisor hiding in a cave formed by the wind. Here is one that looks kind of like a tapir, um, which is a type of mammal that lives in the Malaysian and in the South American rainforests. And this one just looks like a dragon's head to me. My personal favorite though is this one, which is, I know I, I have given the name the Wailing Wall to this one because it looks like, it also, it looks like a bunch of, it looks like a bunch of people or animals. It, it, to me, it looks like a, a herd of tapirs or hippos kind of stampeding or all kind of piling on top of one another. So. It can be the Wailing Wall or the Unhappy Herd. But this was very close to one of my camps, so I walked past this feature several times. And again, you often get these vent effects in the dry valleys because the wind is especially strong there. Again, it's the catabatic winds that actually blow away the snow and make these valleys dry. So that is everything about glaciers. We will begin talking about the human history of Antarctica on Monday. And in office hours on Monday, there will be a review session focused on the material from lectures 11 and 12.
So take care, have a good weekend, and I will see you next week for the Human History of Antarctica.